screen when you're
Welcome, everyone. Welcome to the Stimson Center. My name is Brian Eiler. I am the director of our Southeast Asia program. And uh, it's a pleasure to be here today for our latest uh, iteration of our Building the Indo-Pacific series. And this Building the Indo-Pacific series is a, a platform that we've launched here at the Stimson Center to um, provide a, a public space uh, for US government officials as well as officials from like-minded um, partners uh, that are uh, hard at work and forging new ways to uh, work smartly and pragmatically in the Indo-Pacific region to articulate um, visions and ideas uh, around this Indo-Pacific strategy that, that has come out of not just the US, but of many countries in the region, and, and even ASEAN has an Indo-Pacific vision, vision now. Um, and, and outlook, right, Indo-Pacific outlook. And, and we want to use this platform as a way to convene those stakeholders to deliver messages publicly and, again, articulate those visions. Um, also, we use this uh, series as a way to convene key thought um, leaders and, and conversation uh, drivers um, who can identify opportunities for, say, U.S. investors or U.S. government programming um, or Australian programming. Uh, to pragmatically and strategically engage in regions like Southeast Asia, South Asia, and other parts of the Indo-Pacific. Um, so we're here today to, um, to, to provide that opportunity. Uh, we have the real pleasure of having um, Katrina Cooper here with us, who is the Deputy Head of Mission at the Australian Embassy, and she's been here in Washington since 2017, um, and has previously served in, in, um, in I guess, the latest capacity um, as ambassador to Mexico. Um, and uh, it's, it's a great honor to have her here with us. I'll get back to um, Australia uh, at the end of my remarks and, and then we will welcome Katrina for her introductory remarks. And we're, after those remarks, we're going to have a panel um, that will be moderated by Mark Mealy, the uh, Senior Vice President for Policy at the US ASEAN Business Council, uh, as well as some of our emerging thought leaders, uh, uh, Courtney Weatherby, who is my teammate here at the Stimson Center, and Hiroshi Yasui, uh, who is on loan to the Stimson Center this summer uh, from JBIC, the Japanese Bank of International Cooperation. And unfortunately, we had advertised that um, Dr. Hong Lo Tu uh, from um, Australian Strategy Policy Institute would join us, but she's unable to fly in from Australia this week. Uh, and um, so I'm going to sit in as a, as a discussant on the panel to round things out. Um, Courtney, if you could switch to, oh, wait, to the slide. So Courtney's going to get into this uh, in a bit, but I do want to wet your whistle uh, to kind of get some conversation started. Uh, we've done some analysis that shows just on power generation alone. And today, our, our conversation will focus somewhat on power generation opportunities, that there's a $53 billion, $54 billion gap um, per year for Southeast Asian power generation needs from this year all the way to 2040 um, that is not being filled by MDBs, by bilateral assistance, by uh, local public spending. And this is, this is an area then for an opportunity. I think we should see this as an opportunity uh, for ways to drive competitiveness, to ways, uh, for ways to enjoin public um, uh, infrastructure spending with private infrastructure spending, which is a topic we're going to talk about later today. And Courtney's going to get into the details of how we came up with this. But another thing to think about is that looking at China, and, and I think it's, it's important to draw China out here because in many ways the Indo-Pacific strategy is thinking of ways to compete directly with China. We've had congressmen here at the Stimson Center who have said that the BUILD Act is a way for the U.S. government to go head to head with China on the Belt and Road. And to put this into perspective, we've found through our own research that China is participating in some way, whether it's through owning projects that are build, own, operate, transferred, financing projects, or constructing them as contractors, um, that over almost $100 billion of value of projects uh, are China participated in the lower Mekong countries of Cambodia, Myanmar, Laos, Vietnam, and Thailand. And what's interesting is that there are big gaps here, right? Something is much farther ahead than others. And I want to um, run you through these colors. The gray um, bars are pipeline, 
um, or planned projects, those that have MOUs that have not yet been built. Um, and uh, it's demonstrated in megawatts. Um, the orange are those that are under construction, and the blue are those that are operational. And most of these assets are being developed in the hydropower sector. And what's interesting is the DFC itself has convened something like $60 billion um, to, to mobilize more investment uh, from the US, from Australia, from again, like-minded partners who can develop and deliver this strategy in the region. Um, $60 billion, right, compared to what China's already doing. How can we compete with this? It's something that we're gonna talk about. But I think there is an answer. How can we compete with this? That we can offer alternatives. Uh, 40 gigawatts of this gray line here in hydropower is uh, of MOUs in Myanmar. And there's very little appetite for Chinese invested hydropower in Myanmar. This will not happen. Six, giga six gigawatts are in Laos. Three gigawatts are in Cambodia. All these countries are struggling with moving hydropower projects forward. This is an opportunity for us. I think we should see this as, as an opportunity to kind of chip away or to interact with, to replace some of that gray bar with the areas that the US, Australia, Japan, um, the sectors that we have comparative advantages in, like wind, like solar, like LNG, to meet demand in the region. But then also, our programming can work to more smartly site and to think about how some of this would be built out because some of it will be built out. And it's important to do that because right now, the Mekong region alone, and I'm gonna stump a little bit for the Mekong and then I'll, I'll move on to Katrina's marks, uh, is going through one of the worst droughts in the history of the river, the, the geological history of this river. Um, we pulled the hy hydrographs from Vientiane, the capital of Laos, yesterday, and this red line here is the water level in the Mekong yesterday. Compared to last year's water level, there's a five meter difference. Okay, compared to the lowest low ever observed, there's a one and a half meter difference. This is the worst drought um, that the Mekong has experienced in what should be the monsoon season of the Mekong. And we've produced some images and you can go on my Twitter feed um, and, and, and look at how we've demonstrated that dams are part of the problem. That during a time of drought, these dams are holding back water. The Saibori Dam in Lao is now uh, being tested for operation. It's the first large dam on the mainstream of the Mekong in Laos. And then um, the Jinghong Dam in China is also holding back water. And uh, just for perspective, I've outlined two circles here that compares the 100 year drought, um, a portion of the, the Mekong River in the Golden Triangle, and a sandbar here in the river at the low point of a 100 year drought. And found that on July 19th, just last week, when we should be in the monsoon season, that sandbar is larger than the low point of a 100 year drought. So this is pretty convincing that these dams are part of the problem. So here's an opportunity for us to engage with infrastructure in a way that more smartly manages them, that provides more resources for communities, for countries, for national economies in the region, and, and then also to think about alternatives. Um, because if we don't, um, this, these types of patterns will continue into the future. So thank you for allowing me to stump a little bit about this drought um, in the Mekong, and I hope that that can also color some of our conversation here. In July of last year, uh, there was an announcement that US, Australia, and Japan um, will be getting together uh, to work on the trilateral agreement for infrastructure partnership. And at the G20 in November of last year, that agreement was signed. This is gonna be one of the topics of our conversation today. There are many opportunities for infrastructure cooperation between these three countries. And uh, it's, it's, again, it's a real honor to have um, Ms. Uh, Katrina Cooper here, the Deputy Head of Mission at the Australian Embassy to talk to us about Australia's uh, vision for infrastructure engagement in the region and ways that the US and Japan and like-minded partners can work together. Katrina, thank you. Uh, well, th thank you very much, and uh, thank you very much for the invitation, Brian and Courtney. Um, and uh, very happy to be here to talk today about the um, cooperation that you flagged, Brian, between Australia, Japan, and the United States on infrastructure in the Indo-Pacific. Um, and it is a, a relatively new area for cooperation, as you flagged. 
um, and it has been my pleasure to be involved in the various stages of developing um, that partnership. So I'll talk a little bit later about uh, where we are now and, and how we got there. But I wanted to reflect a little bit at, uh, for a few minutes on the significance of infrastructure because we all know that um, it's absolutely vital for a nation's security and for a nation's prosperity. And I think that little um, vignette you've just shared with us, Brian, about energy and water is a really clear example of the significance of infrastructure. Um, and notwithstanding that we all know about how essential infrastructure is, um, the forecast for the need for infrastructure in the Indo-Pacific um, up until 2030 sits at around $26 trillion. So that's an enormous uh, amount of money that needs to be found to develop adequately the infrastructure um, of the region. Um, that's, um, that they're figures that come from the Asian Development Bank, so you know, very well sourced and um, credible, credible figures. And I think that figure alone uh, shows us very, very clearly that it's not a challenge that can be met by any one country or indeed any group of countries. You know, that amount of money cannot be stumped up by government, um, and nor should it be. Um, so uh, obviously then we need to look at how we can mobilise private capital um, to be able to fill in some of those infrastructure gaps. And the question then for government, of course, which I represent is how do you do that? Um, if it were easy, of course, we wouldn't, be, we wouldn't need government uh, facilitation. Companies would be in there, they would be developing, they would be investing in those infrastructure needs. But clearly that isn't happening. The reason that's not happening is many-fold, um, but it's clearly a difficult and very challenging opportunity, a, a, a very big challenge. But opportunity came to mind because you talked about it as an opportunity, Brian, and I think that's absolutely right. So, I mean, there are many reasons, but some of the reasons that we butt up against quite regularly in terms of why this challenge is so difficult is, is obviously around risk. Um, private investors are looking for return on capital and uh, the economies in a number of these countries are seen as just simply too high risk. Um, so part of the strategy obviously has to be to look at how we de-risk these projects for private capital. Um, the business environments in many of the countries is also difficult and um, you know, not attractive for private investors. So we need to be looking at why are those countries not attractive? Are, they, are there reasons that can be in, influenced by government? Is there something we can do to make those countries more attractive? Is it lack of information? Is it ignorance? Or are there some fundamental structural or other problems that we need to be looking at? And then, of course, um, private sector capital wants, um, you know, bankable and investment-ready projects. So we hear a lot about the pipeline, and I was struck by the very, very long pipeline. You know, there is certainly a lot of projects out there. There's no doubt about that. There's a lot of need. Um, and there's quite a long pipeline. But how do you move projects from the pipeline into bankable, investment-ready propositions? So there's some of the challenges and they might be some of the issues that, that, that are brought out um, during the, the panel discussion a little bit later today. So how then do we make these public-private partnerships uh, work? Um, there's, you know, there's been discussion about that certainly for as long as I can remember in my career and there's no neat answer. Um, and indeed, you know, developed economies struggle with that very same challenge. You know, how do you make private-public partnerships work effectively? Um, but notwithstanding that it's tricky, of course, if we're gonna tap into that private capital, we need to try and unlock that. There's certainly a lot of interest in the region from, a, um, uh, from all of the governments in the region in terms of attracting private sector. So, it's, it's not that countries are not open to private sector investment. They want it and they want assistance in helping uh, attract private capital. Um, and they also want help in improving their project planning, their procurement and their management processes. So there's a, there's a, lot, of, um, uh, a lot we can do also to build capacity in those countries. Um, so as Brian said, um, uh, we, being Australia, Japan, and the United States announced about a year ago now that we were going to enter into a trilateral arrangement 
to focus on developing infrastructure in the Indo-Pacific region. Um, so that's only been a year since we announced it. It wasn't signed though until November. So really this, uh, this partnership has only been up and running for a very small amount of time. That was preceded in fact by the signing of a bilateral arrangement between Australia and the United States in February last year when Prime Minister Turnbull uh, came through and he signed that with uh, Ray Washburn who was then the head of OPIC, the Overseas Private Investment Corporation. One of our very early conversations with Ray Washburn uh, made it clear to us that there was enormous opportunity for, for cooperating uh, with OPIC and in uh, helping OPIC, working with OPIC to identify projects in the Indo-Pacific region where we have um, you know, a lot of a diplomatic presence, a lot of footprint but also a lot of activity. Um, so it's a relatively, you know, I, I give you that background because it's a relatively recent, um, recent partnership. Uh, and very quickly, of course, the discussion or the questions move to, well, what have you got to show for that so far? So I just kind of wanted to put a flag right there um, at the outset that it's quite a, it's quite nascent, it's quite new. Um, so that was signed, you know, at senior level. It was signed by Prime Ministers Morrison and, Prime, uh, and Abe and Vice President Pence. Um, at G20. So it's a very, very high level commitment. So we can't underestimate um, the strength of the commitment of all three countries to, to making this work. And what we're trying to do is to promote high quality infrastructure and to help provide options for financing. That's a really top line level objective. And we're also trying to help countries um, make well informed investment decisions around infrastructure. Uh, and to deliver projects which are transparent and non-discriminatory, uh, that promote fair and open competition. Uh, we want to ensure that those projects uphold robust safeguards, that they meet genuine need, and that they avoid unsustain unsustainable debt burdens. Um, and so while our broad headline objectives of the three countries are shared, each of us obviously very different countries, and we bring different things to the mix. We bring different capabilities and we bring different approaches. So what does Australia bring? Well, we're actually coming to the issue with quite a strong track record, both domestically and international, in infrastructure. Um, you, as you may or may not know, Australia is the sixth largest country by territory, um, but the 13th largest um, economy, and a population of only 25 million. So even those three data points uh, indicate just you know, how thoughtful we have to be about infrastructure, right? We have a low population base and a huge territory. So we have to be really innovative and really efficient uh, in terms of addressing our infrastructure because we don't have, um, uh, you know, huge pools of money to draw on from a, from a large tax or revenue base. So it's got to be pretty clever. Um, but at the moment, we've got an infrastructure boom. We're entering into our 27th year or 28th year now of uninterrupted economic growth. Um, and we're spending more public money now on new transportation and infrastructure than any other major developed country. We've got great private sector investment um, and great sophisticated construction capability. So we're trying to bring some of that domestic framework into the debate and into the international discussion to see if there are lessons that can be drawn, drawn from that. And one of the big lessons is the public-private partnerships that we've used in Australia. And um, one of those, which has been very successful, and um, Ambassador Hockey, our ambassador, talks about it quite a lot when he's out and about, because it was his baby when he was the treasurer, is asset recycling, um, which is primarily about leasing government assets and then taking that return and investing it, earmarking it for, in, uh, for infrastructure. And that's been very, very successful in the states that have taken that on, most notably in New South Wales. Um, uh, we know that there's a lot of interest in this. We talk about it a lot. It's a little bit of a, um, uh, a beacon for countries who are looking domestically at how they can boost their infrastructure spending, uh, including here in a number of states in the United States. And we work also very globally on infrastructure. It has been one of our themes and indeed was a theme of our G20 presidency. Um, and in that year, we set up a global infrastructure hub in Sydney. And that was precisely to try and enhance the quality and flow of such investments around the world. And we also co-chair the G20 Infrastructure Working Group um, and uh, we'll continue to work with other countries including Japan which hosts the G20 this year to help countries try and meet their needs. 
We also work very, very closely and support the World Bank, the Asian Development Bank and the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank to deliver large scale and transformative projects. Um, so, you know, that's our kind of domestic credentials, if you like, uh, and a, a broad snapshot of how we're working more broadly internationally on infrastructure. So, to put that trilateral partnership in context, it is really part and parcel of a broader focus on infrastructure because, as I said at the outset, absolutely critical to the prosperity and the security of the regions, of the nations in our region. Um, we also work bilaterally in the Indo-Pacific region with countries and we help them formulate and deliver their infrastructure development plans. Um, we're particularly active in the Pacific Islands. Uh, we've long been the biggest um, partner in the Pacific Islands, it's our neighbourhood. Uh, we have special and strong relationships with them. And most recently we've um, entered into a, uh, a more intense phase of our relationship with the Pacific Islands, which we refer to as our Pacific Step Up. And part of that Pacific Step Up is helping them focus on infrastructure. And part of that Step Up has been to establish a new infrastructure financing facility for the Pacific Islands, uh, which, uh, into which we've put $2 billion to try and help our neighbours um, uh, improve their tele telecommunications infrastructure, their energy, transport and water infrastructure. Uh, we also focus a lot on Southeast Asia, again our near neighbourhood. And last year Prime Minister Morrison announced a uh, $121 million Southeast Asia Economic Governments Infrastructure Initiative. Um, that particular initiative includes um, regulatory reforms, assistance with progressing those, advice on project preparation, how to mobilise finance, how to foster public-private partnerships and to support management and maintenance. At home, we've also had a look at, at what our domestic uh, infrastructure is for supporting finance and we relaunched our credit export agency just um, on 1 July, in fact, this year. Um, it's now called the Export, Export Finance Australia. It's got a broader remit and it's got new powers to finance overseas infrastructure development, along with an additional $1 billion in, in callable capital. So that's going to be really important in helping us to work alongside OPIC and the Japanese equivalent, JBIC, because we now have an institution that operates more similarly to those institutions. When we signed the MOU, we didn't have an equivalent, um, but now we do. Um, and that reform really is about recognising that private capital entrepreneurialism and open markets are absolutely crucial to regional prosperity and that we should be encouraging them wherever we can. And it also seeks, of course, to enhance the commercial links between Australia and the region. So cumulatively then, taking into account all of those announcements that I've just outlined, we'll bring online over three billion Australian dollars in funding through these new initiatives in, in, in infrastructure investment in the region. Um, so that's a pretty sizeable amount of, of money. So we're certainly you know, putting our money <laughs> where our mouth is, so to speak, and demonstrating not in, only in what we say and how we operate with countries, but also in putting up the funds to show that in, uh, infrastructure is really a priority for Australia and infrastructure in our region is a high priority for Australia. Um, so back to the trilateral partnership um, signed in November and announced at the same time, in fact, in Papua New Guinea, um, an electrification partnership. So that was the first project that we announced uh, under our partnership. And we're cooperating there with Papua New Guinea to bring electricity to an estimated 70% um, of the population. Um, currently there's 14% of the population has electricity. So you know, that's a really significant project. Um, we did conduct a joint mission in April this year uh, with a broad range of agencies. I mean, one of the, one of the challenges of, of, of tackling these big infrastructure projects is just how many players you have to get on board to make it work. So this was a huge range of agencies from partner countries. Um, it did include OPIC, which I mentioned. It included USAID from the United States. It included the um, US Trade and Development Agency, as well as um, counterparts on the Japanese side, JBIC, JICA. Um, New Zealand's also working alongside uh, uh, the trilateral partnership with us on this effort. And um, in fact, it was just earlier this week, so it's a very timely, timely session, that Prime Minister Morrison and Prime Minister Marape of PNG jointly announced that we would de deliver 
a portfolio of investments of 250 million under that electrification partnership. And that would be focused on PNG's largest electricity grid. So that's the first step, if you like, in the implementation of this much bigger electrification project. It's going to be huge. I was posted in Papua New Guinea and I lived there for four years. So I know not only how important it is, but also how tricky it is. So it is going to be a really um, challenging um, but incredibly important project for, for Papua New Guinea. Um, we're also working, as I said, on Southeast Asia. So on the 25th of June, we announced that we were going to do a joint mission to Southeast Asia, um, and we're working on the details of that. Um, it'll be announced shortly. Um, so as I, as I kind of referred to earlier, it's not just about putting the money in, but it's also about helping countries make informed decisions, trying to draw on our own strengths, experiences, lessons learned, share those with the countries that we're working in, and, and, and helping them to look at you know, quality, issues like quality, sustainability, and also about project preparation and all the different transaction phases that are necessary uh, in, a, in a project. We're also um, helping them to build the regulatory environment that's absolutely essential to, to tap into the private sector financing. Um, now these things, obviously, all of these efforts that we're doing are not only going to help in infrastructure, we hope, but also in overall economic governance. And that in turn should then uh, make investing in those countries even more attractive. And we want them ultimately to develop the foundations for sustainable growth. Um, we're looking to report on, I, I always hesitate to say that we're looking to report on something by a certain date, because there are obviously so many variables. But Given that we signed this uh, uh, agreement on the 1st of November and we have very high level commitment, as I mentioned to it, we are looking to do a bit of a report on where we're up to by November. I, I think that's very ambitious to be able to report on progress just one year into, tr into signing something this big. Um, but I am um, feeling uh, uh, a void by the progress that we've made already on the electrification project. Um, we're also learning ourselves, of course. This might sound like, you know, we're trying to help them do this, and, but it's always a two-way process or a multiple-way process. And we're learning a lot from our interaction and our work together on this. You know, how we work together, how we build the habits of co cooperation with these countries, how we develop critical relationships. Um, really, it's like, um, it feels very much like putting together a huge, giant jigsaw puzzle, you know, and sometimes the pieces don't quite fit. You've got to find the right piece. So it is a process um, through which all of us will learn. Um, that's the countries themselves, that's the private sector, that's the development partners, and all of the other agencies and organisations that need to get involved to make these things happen. Um, but hopefully we'll be able to bring all of that puzzle together. It's it's obviously not the entire story. It's just, you know, even that puzzle, once it comes together, is one piece in a much bigger puzzle for the countries of the region, not only in terms of their economic development, but also in terms of infrastructure. You know, there will be many sources of funding. There'll be many opportunities for them to develop their infrastructure, and there'll be many options that they can choose. Um, but we hope at least to get this part of the puzzle um, lined up really well so that countries of the region can see um, what, what is on offer, how the trilateral partnership can assist them and how that can help them develop their own pathways to economic development. Um, I'm sorry that I can't stay longer. I would very much have liked to because, uh, as I said, it's a high priority, but also I've been personally engaged in this issue since I arrived. Um, but unfortunately, I have another commitment. But I do have two folks from my team here, Dylan Fitzsimmons and Rock Chung, who will be here um, for the whole session and who will no doubt be very happy to, um, to discuss any aspects of what we're doing um, uh, afterwards. Um, so thank you very, very much again for the invitation, Brian and Courtney, and thank you, thank you for your time. Hi, my name is Sue Chidakowitz. I'm the president and CEO of Nathan Associates, which is an implementer for USAID and the various banks. 
we do work for DFAT as well. So in that context, I would love your perspective on what is DFAT's role going forward in these infrastructure activities, and are there new interagency procedures in place that match the startup and creation of, of your version of OPIC and JFIT? Yeah. Um, well, as you know very well, of course, um, DFAT also incorporates um, the Development Agency for Australia. So DFAT is the central coordinating point for all of this work. Um, we are working very actively with all of those partners and um, when we travel to those countries, it's, it's, we call on all of our representatives in different countries to try and help bring together meetings and so on. Um, but it has been an interesting exercise because we didn't have, as I said, an equivalent of OPIC or JPIC. And in fact, I think this trilateral partnership was part of the impetus for creating one because it became apparent that while we had grant money available, you know, we weren't able to leverage the private sector funding in the same way that the United States and Japan were. Um, so that's just recent, recently established, um, uh, the, the new agency, FA. Um, it, it will take some time to get up and running, uh, but I expect that there will be a strong partnership between DFAT and EFA in bringing this all together, as there should be. So we very much look forward to working with you, and I think, um, I think it'll be a really exciting time, actually, for, for development in the region. Rich? We'll take your question and one from the gentleman beside you. Okay, uh, thank you. Rich, can you use the microphone? Thank you, I'm Richard Cronin. Uh, uh, I'm, I'm a fellow now at Simpson, but I used to be Brian uh, on the, in the Southeast Asia program. Uh, this is a commendable idea, and we've been, I've been government and around government long enough to know this has been under discussion for years and years and years. And of the many obstacles, and I'll just, just mention one, uh, is uh, that, um, each of the countries involved has different business models, if you will, and Japan more than, perhaps more than any. Uh, and we've never had much success uh, working with Japan on any kind of bilateral basis. And so I wonder how, how you're gonna address this problem in the, the longer term, I mean, in the trilateral basis. But also just, I shudder to think if, if there's how many trillion dollars worth of investment in infrastructure needed in say the next 20, 30 years, what the region will look like <laughs> if all that materialized. I don't think it will. And certainly the three countries here don't have the wherewithal to make that happen. Go ahead. So there are two parts to that question. The first is working with Japan. The second is where do you get all of that money from? And what does it look like? So three parts, I guess. Well, we found Japan to be a, um, a, a very good partner um, on this. In fact, a, a bit of a driving partner on this. Mm. Um, we do have different systems, you're right. Um, I was, I have to say, uh, surprised in a very positive way at how quickly we were able to move through um, the negotiations to get to the point of being able to sign, bearing in mind precisely what you're saying about the different systems. And the fact that Australia didn't have an equivalent at that time of OBIC and JBIC, and the new organisation isn't precisely an equivalent either, um, was, um, you know, was something that, that we all turned over in our minds. Is this going to work? And we've got JBIC, OBIC, and then DFAT, who has no capacity to leverage private sector finance because that's not what we do. How is this going to work? So notwithstanding that, the um, uh, Japanese uh, government was willing to come on board and sign with DFAT as the signing partner. So I took that as a very positive sign also of the commitment of the countries at the various highest levels. So I think in a, the brief answer to your question, I think often it depends on the level of commitment as to whether or not countries are able to work together and get mm. things done. Yeah. And my sense at this early stage is that there is a very high level and sustained commitment to working together on infrastructure, precisely because of the ver bringing in the second part of the question, like the very high numbers, and the realization that um, the countries of the region have an enormous need for infrastructure, and you know what will the what will the region look like, you know, and 
as developed countries who've been able to develop our own infrastructure in a very you know, successful way, obviously not every infrastructure project in every country is successful, um, there is a responsibility really on countries like ours to help the countries in our neighbourhood develop in a way that is sustainable, doesn't leave them with huge debts, um, and has the sort of framework that you need to make infrastructure successful. So I think those sorts of things will be providing enormous impetus to this project. Um, and what will it look like? Well, it will look different in every country, no doubt. Um, but that, you know, and that is why, you know, I flagged a couple of times that it's so complex. Because you can't just identify a project, put together the, the money you need for a project and build the project. You know, if it were that simple, it would be done already. But it is about the longer term and how you bring all the necessary actors in to make it effective and sustainable. So I think it's a, I think it's a huge challenge. Uh, I think it, if it's one that we get right, I think it will be transformative. Um, let's hope we do. We're all working to, right, to see if we can. Thank, Thank you. you. We'll, we'll need that. Folks, we've got to move on to the next portion of our panel. Um, so let's once again give our thanks to Deputy Head of Mission uh, Katrina Cooper for coming to Stimson today. Thank you. So I'd like to invite our moderator, Mr. Mark Mealy, uh, and our panelists, Courtney Rutherby and Hiroshi Asui, up to the stage. Well, good morning, everyone. Just to get us started, uh, first of all, it's a real pleasure for me to be here uh, on behalf of the U.S. Uh, Housing Business Council. Um, I can tell you that there's probably uh, not one of the more uh, most talked about subjects uh, that we've been wrestling with over the past uh, six months or so uh, than this broader topic around uh, the free and open Indo-Pacific vision, uh, questions around the role of the private sector, the American private sector, uh, in partnership with the U.S. government and other governments uh, to really try to fashion, um, I use the term, sort of a credible alternative set of commercial opportunities and partners uh, for, for governments and for business leaders in my part of the world, Southeast Asia, but also in South Asia, uh, really seems to be the strategic objective here. Um, and we've known, I think, sitting here in Washington, there's been lots of speeches, lots of announcements, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and I think we are slowly or gradually, however, you know, sort of turning you want to look at it, uh, begin to see there are really more a tangible kind of components of this effort. Uh, and, and I can tell you again, a lot of folks from the business community, again, remain very interested, very excited. Of course, want to see more details, want to see more understanding. Clearly also want to know more about what resources are really going to be available. Uh, but nonetheless, I think the conversation is certainly really valuable to have. I'm excited that fact that, as, as guess Brian, you mentioned earlier, we may have had people like myself and, and others who maybe are several older thought leaders, but really also to hear new voices uh, and perspectives from some up and coming thought leaders on some of these issues uh, with our two uh, panels today. So just to stop there, I'm going to just invite um, our two speakers to, to begin with their presentations. If you both can keep yourselves to about 10, 12 minutes max uh, for your remarks, uh, and then we'll leave time for really getting an interactive conversation uh, with the audience. I know I've got some questions that I would value your perspectives on and some also points of view from the audience as well. So with that, uh, let me invite. You all have their bios and stuff like that, so I think we all probably just want to sort of get to the, the meat of the conversation. So please begin. OK. Thank you very much. And uh, thank you for being here today. And uh, so today, I'd like to uh, talk about the challenges of, for public finance, especially in the uh, infrastructure development, mainly in Southeast Asia. And uh, please note that today's discussion is based on my experience. Uh, so today, today's discussion reflects my experience in JBIC, but uh, this is sorry, um, my opinion, not JBIC's opinion. 
and uh, this is the uh, Asian infrastructure needs. Uh, as Katrina said, that $26 trillion infrastructure needs by 2013, which means the $1.7 trillion per year. And the electricity sector and the transportation sector are main drivers of these huge needs. On the other hand, investment uh, falls short of these needs. And the investment gap is equivalent to 2.4% of projected GDP uh, in the region. And without China, this investment, investment gap uh, is equivalent to more than 5% of projected, G projected GDP. And in order to fill the gap, gap Japan, Japanese government established the Partnership for Quality Infrastructure in 2015 and expanded it in 2016. So this comprehensive um, picture for policy explanation is very difficult to see. So don't worry. I, I I will explain uh, key takeaways in, next, in the next slide. And uh, this Japan's initiative uh, is mobilizing all Japanese uh, agencies and collaborating uh, with World Bank, ADB, and other international development communities. And JBIC plays a uh, key role in this initiative. Then move on to the key takeaways. Then target amount of Japan's uh, quality infrastructure initiative is the $200 uh, billion dollars in five years to global infrastructure project. And uh, among many key concepts, uh, I think the import, uh, I'd like to introduce two uh, important concepts. The first one is life cycle cost saving. And roughly speaking, life cycle cost is an aggregate of initial cost plus operation and maintenance cost. As infrastructure has long life cycle, like more than 20 years. Uh, operation, cost, operation and maintenance cost is important for host countries in addition to the initial cost. And from the viewpoint, viewpoint of supporting Japanese firms activity in the development activity, and reasonable life cycle cost is a key for Japanese firms to be selected by host countries. Because business model of Japanese firms has shifted from simple export to uh, to investment and uh, involvement in entire business operation. And because there is a severe competition with Chinese developer with a very cheap uh, initial cost. So reliable technology and precise project management, uh, which contribute lowering uh, life cycle cost, uh, are a major advantage of Japanese firms in international competition. And second, um, the strong consideration for the uh, debt sustainability and fiscal soundness. Um, Japan's initiatives uh, intend to, in, to be in line with uh, the de development plan of host countries, not to force unsustainable projects. And, and last month, the G20 finance ministers agreed on the important principles on the uh, importance of debt sustainability in inf infrastructure projects. So, this is in line with the Japan, Japan's initiative and the other global uh, high-level commitment. And uh, I'd like to talk about the ongoing re uh, related partnership uh, with Japan, US, and Australia. And uh, as Katarina said, uh, last November, JVIC, OPIC, and uh, DF, DFAT, and EPIC of Australia signed a memorandum of, of understanding for promoting uh, quality infrastructure and energy and natural resource project in third countries and, and the cooperation of Japan, US, and Australia farms. Um, this led to the uh, Papua New Guinea's joint mission and the uh, next, ne next destination of joint mission will be uh, for Southeast, Southeast Asia region. Also, JBIC signed memorandum of understanding with China Development Bank uh, for the same purpose. This led to the business matching forum in this May. So as long as the uh, Chinese company or Chinese firms uh, follow the international standards like openness, transparency, and so on, so uh, we are very keen to have a partnership uh, of these com companies. So uh, public finance, including public finance institutions, including JBIC, has a key role in promoting quality infrastructure, but I'd like to raise three challenges for public finance institutions. First one is role of public finance. So 
Usually, the role of public finance is set as a catalyst to mobilize private funds. But a study by Center for International, Center for International Development argues that this, fac this function is insufficient. So about private, se private sector windows of multilateral development banks, one, one dollar of loans by MDBs mobilized 1.5 uh, dollars of private finance. Also, about bilateral financial institution, for example, JBIC, one of JBIC's operational principles explicitly says um, we have to supplement the pri private sector financial institutions. So one dollar of JBIC's finance mobilized 2.15 uh, dollars of private finance in 2016. So I don't mean uh, JBIC did a better job, but uh, I'd like to mention, uh, uh, emphasize that this mobilizing private funds is a uh, key effort for the uh, public finance institution. And then moreover, from pro private sector developer, developers' point of view, they have an incentive to increase public finance in, into their, develop, their project develop, development plan. Because uh, given the fact or tendency that public finance usually, pro usually provides bigger amount, uh, longer repayment term, and cheaper interest, lo interest loans uh, than private finance. So how much the developer can correct the public finance uh, in, the, in their project uh, plan affects their price competitiveness, such as uh, rate of, uh, tariff rate of electricity. So in order to, private, in order to mobilize private funds more, uh, public finance institution is now trying to increase equity participation to take more risk and a guarantee to private finance loans. So this is a continuous effort for public finance institution. And second challenge is the shift in size of project in energy, energy sector. This chart are uh, about Europe. And Europe is viewed as the most advanced region about the renewable revolution or smart grid, off grid. So whatever, whatever we call this trend, uh, it clearly shows the center of power generation uh, will shift from uh, coal, nu coal, nuclear, gas to more diverse, uh, diverse renewables. And it will shift from one gigawatt size big project to less than, uh, five, uh, less than 100 megawatt small project. Typically, one minute, one minute of coal-fired plant or gas-fired power plant has more than 500, more than 500 megawatt capacity. This, someti this sometimes reaches billions of dollars of project cost. On the other hand, one wind, turb one wind turbine has around five, five megawatt capacity, so it's very small. And I believe that the public finance institution has done a good job in building big projects by utilizing its strong ties with national government and utilizing its um, strong risk-taking capacity. These big, these big projects now become bigger and more complex, more complex than before. So public finance continue to support these projects. Actually, JBIC is one of the biggest contributors um, in project finance in Asia and the Middle East. However, how to support, uh, how to support many but small projects is a new challenge. Private finance, a uh, project finance requires some sort of economics of scale because legal fees, finance advisory fees, and other due diligence costs is very expensive. Also, public finance institutions usually have constraint about human resource, number of human resources to be involved in many projects. And in Southeast Asia, however, a little bit different future of energy is forecasted. Growing electricity demand itself requires increasing of both fossil fuel energy and re renewable energy. The left chart shows challenges, uh, changes in generation capacity from 2016 to 2014. By 2014, coal and gas will increase more than 80, 80 gigawatt res respectively. Also, renewable energy will increase uh, more, than one, more than 150 gigawatt in total. The light, show, the light chart shows energy mix of Southeast Asia, you can see the, the share of renewables will, will increase gradually. For example, in the Mekong region, 
Laos has the target to increase share of small size. Small size means less than 50, 50 megawatt uh, small size renewable project to meet 30% of its energy consumption by 2050, uh, 2025. Also, Myanmar has a similar, uh, similar target as well. So in addition to continuous effort by public finance to support big projects in Southeast Asia, one way for public finance can contribute the trend of increasing many but small renewable projects is a co cooperation with local banks. In this regard, I'd like to introduce JBIC's recent project in Vietnam. In June 2019, JBIC and other four Japanese commercial banks set up a 200 million credit line to Vietcom Bank, which is a state-owned commercial bank. This credit, credit line is for a number of renewable projects in Vietnam through Vietcom Bank and Vietcom Bank's local knowledge of renewable projects. And such challenge, let's talk about the financial competition with China. So dollars to dollars comparison is not my intention because Japan, US, and Australia aim to catalyze private funds. And so these amount are not total amount of contribution from each country, but we can see the significant impact of the Chinese Belt and Road Initiative. Uh, amount of four to, four to eight trillion dollars uh, in total. This is a pipeline pro project, but uh, we can see the significant impact. And this, this huge amount mainly will come from policy and state-owned banks of China. And also, the, I'd like to touch upon the AIIB. And since its first project in, in 2016, the AIIB's total investment so far is $8.5 billion in 45 projects. It can be said that AIIB has done a modest operation than initially imagined. Also, the AIIB has a number of co-financing projects with World Bank or, or AI, uh, ADB or other international development finance uh, organizations. So this means that the AIIB is in line with international standard, uh, for example, the social and the environmental consideration. So this is good for sustainable development. On the other hand, the BRI's operation is unclear about its debt, sustainab debt sustainability, like uh, infamous Sri Lanka port case, and unclear about social and environment consideration. So as I look current news, it seems that China is shifting to utilize the BRI instead of the AIIB because the BRI's non-marginal settings makes its decision making fast and it's easy to uh, realize China's intention. If so, how to bring China back to multilateral setting like AIIB uh, is a key to coordinate many players' activity in, in the region and sustainable development. This is, I think this is an open-ended question, and I think other areas such as Australia, who are uh, board member in, AI, in the AIB, uh, is very important uh, for both continuing to the AIB's modern operation and the coordination with other countries like Japan or US activity in the region. Also, I think public finance institution, including Japan's initiative and the AIIB or other multilateral development banks, uh, should be piled up and show many best practices of quality infra infrastructure. Considering the risk, risk take capacity and the speed of realizing projects uh, by China's finance, um, the risk capacity and speed are major advantages of China's finance. And if so, we should continue to increase our risk take capacity and improve decision making speed. So, this is my uh, presentation. Thank you for hearing. Great, thank you. I think one particular comment um, that I know we'll probably want to come back to, at least one thing I've been keeping an eye on, um, is this question about. Uh, clearly a new sense of trying to prevent indebtedness uh, on particular on the part of developing countries uh, as well as finance and opportunities. Many of the countries that I get a chance to work into, whether it be you know, Cambodia or Laos, 
um, that sense is, is that new resource and value is very much appreciated. Because we all know in previous decades, uh, there didn't really seem to be that real kind of focus on uh, reducing debt, so to speak. Or particularly, you know, the, we all know in the 70s and 80s, tied aid, structural adjustment programs, all that kind of history uh, that oftentimes really centered around indebtedness uh, seems to have really been a sort of an intellectual shift, uh, which I think is an interesting point we want to come back to. The other point I would note about that maybe circle back to around private financing, uh, which we've all talked about, the importance of trying to attract private capital into projects, uh, into the project. Uh, we all know in the sort of post-2007 world, um, a former major player in private financing for infrastructure, i.e. banks, are really no longer the major players in that space any longer. There may be other sources of private finance that we'd be talking about, but I think it's an, it's an interesting opportunity at a time when we're really looking for more private finance, sort of the historical leader in that space, the big banks, are really no longer in that space in terms of direct financing. But I think it's sort of an interesting opportunity here in 2019. But with that, our next presentation. All right. Uh, thank you, everyone, for joining. I am going to modify my presentation a bit and skip through some of the data that I think has already been touched on in sufficient detail by the earlier presenters because I want to make sure we have enough time for conversation with all of you. So I started out here talking about sort of the energy infrastructure needs. I think it, it's very clear already from the points made that the $26 trillion gap, uh, sorry, that tw $26 trillion need has significant gaps. So instead of running through some of the details there, I'll just note that about one, one important figure for why energy should be a topic to talk about is that more than 50% of that $26 trillion infrastructure estimate is for energy. And that's for all of developing Asia, so it includes sort of the area we look at is Indo-Pacific, South Asia, Southeast Asia, Pacific Islands, but also Central Asia. And I believe that $26 trillion figure also includes China. When you're just looking at South, Southeast Asia and the Pacific Islands, that estimate is about $14 trillion. So just thinking spatially about this is something that I think is useful as we move forward. Uh, for Southeast Asia in particular, I'm going to show that chart Brian showed at the beginning um, to talk about the energy needs there. And it's based on the IEA estimates for Southeast Asia's energy demand through 2040, which is going to rise about 66% and will require an increase in generation capacity from a current level of 240 gigawatts to 565 gigawatts. And Hiroshi sort of showed you the chart looking at the way that that energy mix is going to change already. I also think one thing to note is that that estimate is now a couple years old, and it is worth considering how we're going to see spikes based on the trade war between US and China and the shift of energy intensive manufacturing out of China and into Southeast Asia. Vietnam in particular has already seen a shift in their own energy demand as they're currently working on their power development plan revisions where they had expected the biggest gap to be in the south and they're now expecting the biggest gap to be in the north because of this influx of investment. So this may change some of these projections depending on the severity of that shift. The chart that I wanted to talk very briefly about just to give you a little background on it is this chart showing the energy investment needs. It's essentially a breakdown of the annual spending needs based on the IEA estimates for energy infrastructure in Southeast Asia from 2017 to 2040. And as you can see, the annual spending needs that are, that are estimated here are a little over $125 billion. ASEAN, on average, in the last 15 years, has spent about $50 billion through public spending on energy infrastructure generation and also on oil and gas fuel exploration and development. So when you consider that, and then you consider all of the multilateral development bank financing that's available, we still see a significant gap. The orange on this chart is the gap that we're seeing on an annual basis that needs to be filled by the private sector. Um, the calculation of the MDBs is split off to the side there. And a note on that is simply that it's very difficult to find multinational development bank breakdown by both sector and region on an annual basis. So this is basically saying if all of the an half of all of the annual spending on infrastructure from key multinational development banks was invested in Southeast Asia, you would still see this significant gap of about $55 billion. Since we know that that is sort of a best case scenario, the actual gap is going to be notably larger. So just for context, 
this is the infrastructure needs. As Katrina mentioned earlier, it's very clear that no individual country, not even China, which gets a lot of attention for the huge amounts of money that BRI is pouring into the region, is really capable or interested in meeting this need every year. And so there is a significant need to work on the private sector engagement. I'm not going to spend too much time talking about China's Belt and Road Initiative. I think we're all familiar with it, and Brian already highlighted some of the trends and challenges. Um, I do think it's, it's worth simply noting that a significant portion of Southeast Asia energy sector is captured by Chinese interests. Brian already showed you the chart here looking at the $96 billion of China invested, developed, or otherwise involved projects that we see just in mainland Southeast Asia. So to look at sort of a snapshot of a couple individual countries in that region, just on investment basis alone, you can see that apart from the host country, which usually plays a role to some degree in many of the energy projects that are developed within its borders, China is going to be the largest outside investor in almost every case. For Cambodia here, we see China is invested in almost, or actually I think that black pushes it up there, um, to 5,500 megawatts of, of energy. That's more than twice what Cambodia currently has installed in its entire system. And if you look at that pipeline, um, outside analysts have said that's about 80% of Cambodia's energy sector is dependent in some way on China. If we're looking at foreign funders for Laos, Laos is sort of the outlier here in that Thailand is actually the largest project investor, um, partly because they are buying so much of the power from Laos. But after that, you see that it's a significant drop before you get to China. Um, the U.S. and Japan are, are really a sort of minimal players in Laos energy sector at this point. And for Myanmar, once again, mainly due to the significant pipeline of hydropower that Brian pointed out earlier of, of more than 40,000 megawatts of Chinese invested hydropower projects in Myanmar's pipeline, um, it's the largest followed again by Thailand. And once again, U.S. and Japan are fairly small. Um, Australia doesn't even show up in the top seven investors in these three examples, and that seemed to be true for the other mainland Southeast Asia cases that we saw. Well, Carmen, can you, can you, uh, sorry, can you distinguish between, when you say investment, are you talking about in real investment, FDI, or ad loans, or? So it, it's, it's any project that is receiving financing from China. So we're, we're, when, we, when we sort of did these categories, we split it out to um, investment from China, project development from China, where the whole project would be sort of like a build and operate transfer project, and then contracting, where a Chinese company would come in and build the project, but then it is owned and operated by, by other, others. This is just looking at the financing for funding. So within that context, and being cognizant of the very serious financial um, debt sustainability concerns, as well as environmental, social concerns, and labor concerns that really surrounds a lot of Chinese projects in the region, whether they're Belt and Road affiliated or not, uh, because a lot of these projects do predate BRI and have sort of been swept into this conversation about BRI, although they were done by, by local developers or, or outside the system of BRI. That context very much frames <clears throat> the U.S. free and open Indo-Pacific response to infrastructure and energy needs in Southeast Asia. Um, so just looking at this, I, th I think many of you will be familiar, but I'm still going to very briefly touch on sort of what's been done um, and what, what has come out of the free and open Indo-Pacific initiatives here in the United States, specifically focusing on energy. So the biggest and, and most specific case is the Asia Edge program, which is enhancing development and growth through energy. Uh, it was announced almost a year ago now by Secretary Pompeo um, at the USCC, and it laid out this, this vision of significant amounts of funding, I think about $40 million, uh, that would be poured into energy needs in the region. To date, since the announcement, it hasn't necessarily gotten quite as much attention as a lot of people might have hoped right after the initial announcement, largely because this funding that has come out has not been new tranches of funding, but it has been rolled into expansion and development of existing programs. So a lot of the, if you go to the Asia Edge program page, you'll see a landing page with a list of programs, many of which predated the Asia Edge initiative, but which are now receiving significantly increased resources to do the work on um, developing energy access, developing regional markets, developing capacity that were already taking place. 
Um, so, so Asia Edge is still very much alive. We're expecting to see significant announcements for new tranches of engagement coming out later this year. So it may not be out and, and operational by the first year anniversary of Asia Edge, but the groundwork has very much been laid behind the scenes for significant um, engagement on, on this issue in Southeast Asia. And I just want to add, Courtney, that the Stimson Center, our team, is part of the Make Hall Safeguards project. It's a new USAID project that is, has been labeled as an Asia Edge project. So we're, mm -hmm. we're involved with this as well. Yeah, and then that project's looking sort of specifically at safeguards issues in the region. Um, obviously, more broadly, the BUILD Act and the re redesign of U.S. development assistance has been sort of the headline here, and, and specifically looking at the unlocking of private sector engagement in the region. Um, this is sort of the key flagship initiative. As we all know, OPIC is turning to the new U.S. Development Finance Corporation. Um, it's going to be coming online as the new U.S. DFC in early fall. I, I last heard that there, there are hopes that this announcement will come ahead of schedule, um, but it is very much a transition. The biggest takeaways from the Build Act are that it doubles the spending capacity from about 29 billion to 60 billion, um, and it lifts a lot of the key limitations which previously made U.S. development assistance uncompetitive. And th that ranges from things like um, issues with foreign exchange risk where now the DFC will be able to provide loans in local currency, whereas previously OPIC could not. Um, it includes some other shifts to programming. It allows for OPIC to directly engage where relevant and necessary in some capacity building. Um, obviously, that would be lo largely tied in with what USAID is doing more broadly. Um, the new board will have USAID playing a key role. So it will, it will clearly integrate OPEC a little bit more strongly into the broader US development portfolio. Um, all, obviously, all of this is not yet off the ground. So it's still being developed. A lot of the internal kinks are still being worked out. I'm very excited for when the DFC launches later this year to see the type of projects that it expands into in the coming years. And sort of the third program that I wanted to just highlight under Indo-Pacific Economic Vision is the Japan-U.S. Strategic Energy Partnership, which is a couple of years old. It was started in 2017, um, and it, as, as discussed earlier, was sort of tied in and, and developed out of a lot of those multilateral, now multilateral, initially bilateral agreements that were signed between JBEC and, and OPEC, between USTDA and actually in the, sort of the other development actors. So JUSEP itself um, focuses broadly on really two things at this point, expansion of LNG markets in the region, which is in both US and Japanese interests, and infrastructure in third countries. There was in the initial announcement also a focus on civilian nuclear technology. Um, that has not gotten as much attention, probably simply because this administration and the market forces behind LNG expansion in the region are really pushing conversation, particularly on that issue. I'm not gonna talk too much about Japan's regional engagements because Hiroshi really already did that, uh, so I'll skip this slide. Um, but I think sort of the most useful contribution that I have given all of that context that I just ran through is some en engagement and research that I did on obstacles to US-Japan collaboration. And I think some of these are unique to US-Japan collaboration, but some of them would also apply to US-Japan-Australia or US-Australia collaboration. So earlier this year, I did a three-month fellowship with the East-West Center with more than 30 interviews here in Tokyo and in Osaka, just looking at what private sector and policymakers, stakeholders saw as the key obstacles to collaboration under all of these new initiatives that are coming out. And the first real challenge is just that bureaucratic challenges abound. Um, national aid agencies and OPEC and JBEC have very different internal structures. It's not often a one-to-one -one comparison between offices responsible for things, so it requires developing a more in-depth understanding of one another's organizational structure and building the connections between the many offices that are involved rather than just sort of a one-to-one -one comparison. Um, there's also very strong branding preferences. Uh, this is something that I got a sense was much stronger on the Japan side than elsewhere, but a lot of um, JBEC and, and JICA and other Japanese government organ organizational capacity towards these big development projects has previously been founded around building a national-led consortium. So the supply chain, the project developer, the financing, it's a Japan project, it's marketed as a Japan project. That makes perfect sense, but it means at the working level, these, these people thinking through projects, even projects that might be collaborative with the United States, are not geared towards developing 
these consortiums and projects in a way that is multinational in nature. Um, so these differences in sort of regulatory practices, um, the habits of cooperation that have been mentioned earlier simply are not in place between the bureaucracies. Um, the second is that from many of the people I spoke to in the private sector, there was this sense, and I think stronger abroad than here, that the overhaul of development finance is slow out the gates. When you compare, for instance, to China, China loves to make these big announcements and then give a list of very specific projects that they're going to be working on when they make the announcement. Many of those projects may not pop up again in news or you may hear nothing about them for some period of time, but there is sort of this sense that when an announcement is made, it involves a lot of off-the-ground cooperation. I think a good example is the, of, with this is the China Development Bank JBIC agreement that was signed and included a list of 40 specific projects that had already been under some level of discussion were ready to move forward. Whereas the United States and, and its allies are much more focused on building a truly strong, comprehensive partnership. So they're not going to announce projects that they're not sure of. So out, just out the gates, it may seem that a lot of this development is very slow, but a lot is happening behind closed doors internally to prepare for a layout. That said, I think a lot of the companies I spoke with were sort of in a holding pattern where they felt that they were not getting sufficient information on what was happening with the OPEC transformation into the DFC, um, or they simply hadn't been communicated much. JBIC has been very communicative with a lot of companies it works with about sort of its interest in these opportunities. Many of them were unfamiliar with um, sort of what was happening with the US and how they might access it, even among people who generally were tracking these developments. And finally, there was a lack of sort of existing private sector consortium partnerships that were ready to just roll these projects out the gate. Um, so there is this sense among many I spoke to that there are linkages, but they're often sort of far up the supply chain where U.S. companies would be supplying high-tech turbines, for instance, to a Japanese-led energy project on the ground, but the rest of the project was largely run by Japanese companies. So it wasn't a true collaborative project from the beginning where you had different companies in a multinational setting engaging in a full consortium. It was more Japanese-led with American integration of counterparts or vice versa. Um, building these new relationships will take time. I know there's been a lot of work under JUSEP um, to, to have these sort of matchmaking meetings. I know they've held one in Jakarta and one in Bangkok, and I think there's another that will be held later this year to help build these relationships. But taking that tentative relationship that has just been started to, starting to develop over this last year and turning it into an actual concrete project is going to take time. Um, that's it. I'm going to skip this because Katrina has already talked about the PNG electrification project. So just moving forward, I think given these existing obstacles, it's relevant to consider um, that the coordination of separate but complementary projects may be more practical in the near term. Um, for an, a specific example of what this could look like is that I know of projects that U.S. companies are interested in investing in in mainland Southeast Asia. Um, and I know that there are Japanese transmission lines. These companies weren't aware of one another, even though there are obvious complementarities between their interests in the region. So trying to do more matchmaking and building on those lines may be more short term. Um, the other factors that I think are worth discussing are just to, for the US government in particular to identify priority areas and opportunities beyond um, LNG, which has taken over a lot of the conversation here. And this is particularly important given the point that Brian made about what China is investing in in the region versus what there's real need for and what, what the US and Japan and Australia and others have expertise in, particularly looking at integration of renewables, smart grid, and then again, LN, and LNG is, is a portion of that but has taken a very large portion of attention. There's perhaps more opportunity in this renewable sector and efficiency in smart grids than has been discussed. Um, and finally, just that strategic coordination really requires prioritization of projects into a pipeline. Um, which requires clear communication between different competing actors inside each government and across governments. I think one of sort of the challenges that I ran into is that there was this broad political consensus that there needs to be um, more leadership, for, particularly from the U.S. side, on creating a prioritization of a project that the U.S. wants to support through OPEC, but that OPEC is not necessarily set up, nor does it really have the mandate to make that pipeline. They have a mandate to consider strategic considerations and concerns when deciding what they're funding, but there isn't necessarily 
a pipeline that draws on what's happening with all of the other US agencies and the opportunities they identify that feeds that into OPEC. And I, I think there, there may be a lot being done behind the scenes on this, but this was a concern that was raised by various stakeholders. So with that, I'm going to end because I think I've gone more than 12 minutes. So I'm sorry for that, Mike. I'm sorry, too. Mark, but. No problem. <coughs> um, just from, what, what is our? We can go for an extra five minutes. Okay. If folks have to leave at 12, that's fine. Uh, but okay. we can go for till 12.05. OK, fantastic, fantastic. Um, did you want to offer a quick intervention? Or? No. OK, we'll, 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 let's open the floor then, because we do have some colleagues that I know uh, that are here that may want to tee up some questions. I see some embassy friends as well uh, that they would offer some perspectives. So why don't we try to get uh, two or three on the table, and then we can let our panelists respond to those questions. So I see one in the back there. Uh, okay, I'll offer a second and a third. Fantastic. That'll be the first round. Hey, thank you very much. Those were just fantastic presentations, um, full of information. I think everyone was taking pictures and writing as quickly as they could. Um, this is really for uh, for Courtney and Mark for you as well. Um, you know, working with um, a lot of U.S. companies, we have of course seen questions about how quickly things are moving out around Development Finance Corporation, and uh, it would be wonderful here to hear just very briefly. Um, kind of how you are seeing these projects uh, develop um, kind of behind closed doors where there, um, where there is being progress being made and then maybe where some of the roadblocks in terms of interagency coordination to move that forward. Um, sorry, I know that's a very US specific question, um, but it would be really great to hear. Thank you. Hi, I'm uh, Chris Robin. I'm a fellow at one, Sasakawa one, Foundation one, two, USA. Test, test, um, one, two. Most of the talk here is about one, Southeast two. Asia, but I wanted to ask about the Pacific Islands because I think it's a slightly different situation. So the first part of the question is, um, is the need for infrastructure investment different in the Pacific Islands, specifically as it is focused on energy? And the second part is, is the recipe for success different? And specifically what I mean is, is private sector investment even uh, a possibility or is it just all about aid? Friends at CSIS back in April did a, uh, did a report with recommendations sort of on sort of U.S. Australia uh, collaboration. Uh, uh, some of the recommendations I found. Well, so it's on right now. Okay. So I just out a general question. There was a real focus on this notion of uh, low quality sort of foreign investment in energy versus high quality foreign investment in energy, and really making a demarcation. And I was curious to get some thoughts on sort of how would we sort of try to really define that difference? And more importantly, uh, in the case of, let's say, third countries, who really does get to define? The radio uh, on, yeah. Green light's on, red light's off. One, two, three, four, five. Can you hear me okay? Yeah. Four, five. There's always, there's always two things uh, that can... It's always two things that can screw up a meeting. It's so hot, people go to sleep, yeah. or people can't hear. Yeah, exactly. uh, I will try to do sort of a quick stab uh, um, at answering John's question. It'll be very okay. quick. Okay, you can be it, the head, deputy, sort of you can be the chief of mission of the embassy here. Doors and get it out in public setting. There are a lot of projects I know are in the pipeline. No. No. The time just is not right to announce them, and there's still cases being That's her involved. name. So I, that, one of the many reasons I do expect to see on both Asia Edge and, and on OPEC. We'll uh, well, how many of those do we have? Projects two, within two, the next two? five to six months. Okay. Um, uh, I've heard from multiple people. One of them we might just kind of pass up. And Alex and will take the other one been announced yet around to. Uh, until they're ready to go. Um, and I expect most of those will happen after the DFC launches yeah, in the next couple of months. One, two, one, two, one, two. Well, I've, well, I've got a mic here. Question. Yeah. I don't Is have it on? Oh, yeah, it's on. Okay. Power etc. I do get the sense, based on the number of projects that I've seen in the energy sector before, that that is a serious need. I do also think that Hiroshi's point about the size of those projects being very different from historical, due particularly to the low populations and the broad um, geographic swath of, of area that is covered by the Pacific Islands, that it will require a very different approach to sort of the traditional big infrastructure model. Um, mini grids are probably much more the, the route that a lot of these islands are going to need to take. Um, and I, I think it's also important to consider sort of China's role 
there. I know China has come out with a lot of funding. And if you look at the projects that China is funding, there are almost all those very large infrastructure projects, whether that's a port or a large power plant on one of the islands um, that needs it. So I do think that, that the flexibility and interest in smaller scale projects and experience funding um, multi-phase and smaller scale projects from other development partners is potentially very useful. Um, and I think Mark might have thoughts on the private sector engagement there, perhaps. But very, very limited. I think a lot of folks have been optimistic. Uh, as many of you know, there's going to be a big forum in Thailand on uh, November 4th, uh, a free and open Indo-Pacific business forum event. Um, I would envision or imagine that uh, that will be a platform to try to announce uh, new projects uh, that America, Japan, Australia, other partners um, are going to try to do. We're going to be working together to move these projects forward. So I might look for that as a, a concrete. Yeah. And I, um, just to add to this, I we've been tracking kind of the identification of both opportunities that um, say the DFC is, is looking at or the State Department or USAID for investment, for smart investments, uh, and then watching those opportunities being matched with, with champions or interests that can fill those, those gaps. So I think that you're right, Mark, November 4th is the date to watch um, for some announcements coming out. Um, for high quality, I, I believe that, and, and also to get to the interagency cooperation question, um, we've been doing messaging with, with USAID on Asia Edge um, to say, you know, a, a, a high quality power system from a domestic, uh, domestic view or a regional view is more than just building a nice, diverse, and reliable pie chart for a power sector, right? Um, one that is, you know, with renewables forward and climate forward and reliable and provides firm power. You can still make mistakes um, by doing diversified and reliable power. Uh, particularly in, say, the Mekong region, by promoting too much hydropower or wrongly citing hydropower. So there needs to be a connection among the agencies, and the State Department does great work on uh, water energy food nexus uh, programming, uh, USAID also, but doesn't, USAID's programs to date haven't really connected the water and the food to the energy. So there are opportunities here. I and mean, we see these as opportunities for the aid programs to work together. And, and here's also an opportunity for, for DFAT, um, because DFAT's water work in Southeast Asia is, is the best. And if, if you're in the Mekong discourse, you know it. Um, so this is a, an opportunity to enjoin some of these US-focused energy efforts with Australian um, and, and Japanese efforts to achieve what we've been talking about as a low cost, low carbon, low environmental impact energy transition. Because if you just build a nice pie, you might get low cost, low carbon, high impact, and all that. Those costs come back to create high costs later on in the end. Yeah, very, very, very short comment about the interagency inter coordination or more broad picture interagency cooperation. And uh, um, my, my presentation focused on the more finance se sector, um, finance side, but uh, as, as I for as uh, far as I understand, uh, JICA's uh, technical assistance or capacity building up activity to the local government to establish the more uh, high quality, for example, environmental standards or more efficient stan standard of, of the using energy. And th this is particularly important for the realizing the project for the Japanese, US, Japan, US, Australia company. And they, we have the uh, advantage of the efficiency and uh, uh, high environmental consideration. So th this kind of the, uh, from the upstream, the, like the master development plan or regulation to the specific project, the, this kind of the, um, inter interagency cooperation is the key for the realizing good project. Let's do another round of questions. We'll go here. And second, Rick, OK, we'll get two more on the table. Thanks very much, Mark, and thank you for the uh, for all the useful comments. Um, I'm Andrea from the Singapore Embassy, and I just wanted to make a, a short pitch uh, for Singapore's efforts in the infrastructure space. Um, last year, we set up um, Infrastructure Asia, which is meant to be a coordinated unit within the government that would try and bring in private sector players uh, and match make opportunities uh, with the the suppliers. Um, in March earlier this year, we also signed an, o uh, an o MOU with OPIC. It seems to be the <laughs> flavor of the day. Um, and I, I just wanted to share that one of the challenges that we face in, in working with um, the US is really that 
the, uh, I mean, financing aside, uh, it, it really requires a, a whole suite of tools in order to make uh, an infrastructure project uh, bankable, investable, and high quality. Um, so from Singapore's perspective, we care very much about project preparation, getting uh, all sorts of different stakeholders on board to prepare that project, um, but we find that the interest here on this end tends to be just about plugging a financing gap. Uh, I wonder what your thoughts are on this and, and how we can bridge uh, those differences. To pick one halfway, I, I was in a conversation with some friends from Korea, and as the back and forth was looking around around sort of how we could Korea and U.S. could collaborate more, some of those kinds of differences in the nature of engagement kind of remerged in the conversation, so to speak. So, please. Uh, hi, my name is Paul Kent. I'm with Nathan Associates. One of the comments before, I just just an observation, then I'll have a question, uh, relates to countries' needs versus China's needs in China's investments in foreign countries are really tied to their strategy. Uh, if you look at what's happening with freight corridor development uh, through Pakistan and Gwadar, and then on the other side now uh, with the new port of Chak Pyu uh, in Burma, it's a similar case. So uh, what I have found is that the Chinese model is to Leverage investment, equity investment from the country, so everyone knows about the debt trap, yes? But in so doing, they don't recognize the equity inherent in the, the making land available from the countryside, yes? So uh, usually in best practice concession transactions, you recognize the value of land as part of the transaction. And, and uh, so uh, I'm hoping that as uh, various interests move forward with infrastructure investments, that that, that important piece of the pie, that equity investment, uh, is recognized. And uh, related to that also, uh, which I don't think is good practice, is that countries, many countries in the region, feel they should have equity participation instead of uh, receiving a fixed and variable payment on the concession. Okay, so fixed and variable guarantees revenue. Yes, and there's no upfront cost, and there's no, uh, and none of this messy stuff about calculating profit for equity distribution. So uh, I'm hopeful, but I don't see it here. I'm hopeful that in project preparation that these kinds of best practices are incorporated uh, into the structure of the transaction so that countries recognize, are recognized for the value of their land as an example and that taking equity participation in a project is not so important uh, as it is getting royalties uh, in some way. So I just wanted to bring that up and get your impressions from that. Yeah, I mean, I, I think my initial thought is that I, I think in principle that's, that's absolutely true. The, the issue for I think a lot of these countries, particularly with the energy sector and sometimes with some of the other big infrastructure sectors, is sort of that sovereignty question, that they want to feel they have a stake in the project. And so for that reason, more in, more in some ways than for financial reasons, there's the sense they need to have an equity stake. And obviously that's setting aside um, the limitations that quite a few countries, particularly um, discusses Indonesia's requirements for significant equity ownership by local stakeholders, um, government or otherwise, as, as sort of that sovereignty national challenge. And I'm not sure how, how negotiable that is in some places, but I absolutely agree, particularly for countries that are looking at debt issues and are cash straps, that the taking not equity but instead the royalties makes potentially more sense in the short term. Um, I, th I think also just from the point that Andrea made about sort of how to move beyond just the financing question. I think this, the standards issue is one that is, is particularly important and did actually get quite a bit of attention at Osaka. I know there was some discussion about potentially moving forward and identifying a code of, of how, you know, how do you define high quality infrastructure and a code for, for countries that want to build high quality infrastructure and label it as such. I think having multinational engagement on that issue is potentially particularly useful and would very much build on the discussions that are already taking place trilaterally. Um, and besides that, I think that, that sort of the capacity building aspects, particularly on the regulatory side um, 
for, for energy in Southeast Asia, for instance, is something that I think each of our countries is, is already doing. I know the U.S. has Clean Power Asia and many other initiatives that are aimed at trying to address the policy issues that make projects unbankable. Um, so there is engagement. I think it, it, you're very right. It would be great to see more discussion on that here, I think, because it's not necessarily quantitative. It doesn't tend to get as much attention as the infrastructure gap as we saw in our charts earlier today. And my only ad addition to that is that I think, Andrew, you helped us identify our next uh, <laughs> series, our next <laughs> event topic, um, Singapore as a uh, definer of high quality infrastructure for Southeast Asia and its role. Third party program that, that you all have. Uh, let's talk afterwards. <laughs> Yeah, I would just to echo some of these points, I was going to highlight the fact I think for Southeast Asia focused in particular, there are a lot of Southeast Asian ASEAN institutions right. that are geared, obviously, focused on infrastructure. And sometimes, I guess we would wonder or we would assume that as partners who want to collaborate in Southeast Asia, it would behoove the partners to make sure they're sitting down with ASEAN's own infrastructure institutions to make sure there's at least synergies of interest and revenue. That actually does help to a point, again, another one of the recommendations from the CSIS report, recommendation that the partners should really sit down with regional players and really try to develop a consensus on certain principles and definition and metrics that really resonate and really reflect the same value proposition of those in Southeast Asia where you want to do this work. And to your point, would that consensus maybe say, you know what, if you're a Myanmar or something like that, you should either A, if you're providing land, that should be part of the equation, or should a less developing country really emphasize our royalty payment opportunity uh, on the front end of a deal, should that be something that those in the region feel, yes, we have a consensus around that. But that kind of conversation, again, I don't, I don't know if that kind of thing is really happening, so to speak, it's one of the recommendations. And the last thing I would throw out to everyone, and when you got to your point around um, some of these new partnerships and obviously new sources of financing, at the end of the day, again, trying to be more competitive vis-a-vis uh, -vis China. Um, we all know, going backwards here, one of the reasons why I guess we would say some of these, why China was considered an alternative to sort of traditional Western finance historically was because, what did China always say? Yeah, we're not going to get into like you know tied aid and conditionality and all those kinds of things, right? right? And for many many countries, they were like, "Oh, China, you now represent an alternative." And for some developing countries, that was quite appealing, right? An alternative. Here we are now again, full circle. <laughs> we want to now, quote unquote, offer an alternative to the alternative, right? Here in 2019 and going forward, I would find one of the more interesting recommendations again from the CSIS report went to, are there things that make sort of U.S. sources of finance less competitive? And one of their recommendations was, and again, we probably would have a longer debate about, support should not be tied to sort of, you know, quote unquote, good governance or governance or anti-corruption, all those kind of things, those sort of conditionality points. I would probably would have thrown in uh, maybe support tied to really building capacity right. in those areas and really making a strong connection there. But this notion of, if China's offering sort of, you know, free willy-nilly, you know, cheap money, and the alternative is saying, yes, we offer competitive price money, but it comes with these kinds of requirements. Again, some <coughs> countries may not really see ours as a, again, legitimate, commercially competitive alternative for them. And I think, again, that's really what this competition is really about. Please join me in thanking our panelists. Very positive discussion. Appreciate it.